We'll take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. For those who may be joining us for the first time, we, uh, um, we're working our way through the book of the Revelation. Many people wonder about the book of the Revelation and wonder um, what it all means. And today we're going to look at the next step in this book of the Revelation as the prophecy unfolds. I begin this way. Most of you know that I've been a musician most of my life, professional musician since I was about 16, gospel musician, loved the gospel music, loved the contemporary when it, came, when it started coming out. I just love all forms of music. I'm pretty eclectic. Years ago, there was a songwriter that some of you would know, some of his music, but his name was Stuart Hamlin. Stuart Hamlin began one of his songs this way. Though man may strive to go beyond the reef of space, to crawl beyond the distant glimmering stars. Now watch this. This world is a room so small within my father's house. The open sky is but a portion of his yard. Brother Eric did a great job this morning of pointing us to the Father. Too often, we start our preaching and our teaching and our study from the wrong premise. Honestly, as a preacher for over 30 years, the Americanized culture almost demands it. The attitude is, or something like this, you need to preach to me, you need to preach and teach to my felt needs because that is really what I need. And this is, this is a result, honestly, of three decades of the church growth movement <clears throat> and an upside down society. To the people who would say that it's all about me, let me just deliver some sad news to all of us this morning. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. It's not even all about mankind. This book that we are going to read from, this book is all about him. It's, all a, it's his story. In there you'll find the story of creation. You'll find the story of the Red Sea. You'll find deliverance from Egypt. You'll find water from the rock. You'll find the Ten Commandments. You'll find the flood. You'll find the... Yeah, the list goes on. You'll find it all there. But it's a story about God. It's not a story about us. Mankind simply gets to participate in part of his story. You see him in Genesis. He created the world from nothing. You see him all through the Bible. You see him trying to bring fallen mankind back to himself. And then you see in the Revelation as he's there when the world's concluded. When time draws to... I want to I speak this to the 21st century Americans. When time draws to a close, it will not be about you or me, or mankind, it will all be about Him. We need to have that in our mind. The best thing I can do as your pastor is point you to Him. Point you to God the Father. Point you to His Son, Jesus Christ. Point you to that wonderful person in the Spirit that called the Holy Spirit that Jesus said he would send to us. My life and your life will only be better. Are you listening? My life and your life will only be better if we find a way to find God, forsake ourselves in the things of this world, and follow him. We will be better. We will be have a more fulfilled life if we discover God's goodness and greatness. And that's the title of the message today. God's goodness and greatness. So I begin with this question. 
Is God good and is God great? And we sing about it. <laughs> yeah. I remember the old uh, Don Moen song, and boy, I love these old gospel songs, Eric. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. Boy, I love that song. Today, we sing songs about God being great. Kids taught it to us the years that we were, on, we were in a, uh, two services. It's your breath in our lungs that we pour out our praise to you only. What's the last line? Great are you, Lord. I mean, I, I could sing other songs. We could, we could get Eric and the ladies back up here and we could sing songs about the goodness and the greatness of God. But here's my question for you today. Is he good? Is he great? Because of what he does or who he is? How you answer that question is important. You know why? Because if you believe he is only good and great because of what he does, what does it do to your theology when you ask him to do something for you and he does it another way or he doesn't do it at all? I submit that in those cases, your spiritual life, your spiritual world may go upside down because of a misunderstanding of who God is. God is good. God is great. No matter what he does, He's God. We need to have a proper perspective of God. God has loved you and me since creating us. He's loved mankind so much that even when mankind, even in the garden, when mankind chose to disobey him, he immediately put in place a way for mankind to be restored and have eternal life. For those who accept God's offer of salvation through Christ Jesus, you can look forward, as we study this book of the Revelation, you can look forward to eternal life. Yes, there may be bumps in the road. Yes, you may be persecuted for your faith. But I've read the end of the book and you win if you accept his offer. If you refuse his offer, judgment's coming. And there's nothing that you or I can do about it. When I read Revelation, I've already told you all this in previous messages. I see this as a book of encouragement. The, the first century Christians needed encouragement that God was still in control, that it was still going to be all right in the end. Today, people in, in the Christian faith need to be encouraged. People in the church need to be encouraged that God is still in control. We've already gone through six chapters. I'm not going to rehearse all those six chapters, but I will remind you, last week, chapter 6, was filled with six seals, five of them which brought judgment to the earth. Today we get to chapter 7. Chapter 7, you're going to discover, is kind of an interlude in all of this. You expect to turn it to chapter 7, and he popped that seventh seal but he doesn't. So if you will, you can. Would you stand to honor the reading of God's word as we read chapter 7 of the Revelation? Listen, follow along. This is indeed God's holy word. John writes, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth restraining the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel rising up from the coast who had the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were allowed to harm the earth and the sea. Don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the Israelites. 
12,000 sealed from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of 12,000 sealed from the tribe of Benjamin. After this, I looked. And there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out, in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels around the throne and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell down before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, Who are these people in white robes and where did they come from? Ah, that's John. I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The ones seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them. Neither will any scorching heat. For the Lamb, who is at the center of the throne, will shepherd them. He will guide them to the springs of the water of life. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that in, for the balance of this service, I pray you'll have freedom in this room to draw us to yourself, to see ourselves in light of the end of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Most of us remember 9-11. In the aftermath of 9-11, experts tell us that it was only for three weeks that people were actually paying attention. But for those three weeks, people were paying extraordinary attention because as we are told, the people of America, for the first time in a long time, were shaken to the core. Shaken to the core. I remind you that at the end of chapter six, as the sixth seal was open that there was a great shaking of the earth. The earth shook. The skies ripped in two. The stars fell. And it scared the people on earth. These people who were too prideful to bow before the Lamb, it scared them so much that they wanted the hills and the rocks and everything to fall on them. They were, they were running and hiding because they finally, they finally recognized and realized the power of the one on the throne and the power of the Lamb. Whenever I read or hear of something being shaken, I'm always reminded of the book of Acts chapter 4. You see, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John had healed the man at the gate beautiful. He had been crippled from, since birth and they healed him. And then they got arrested and then they were told not to talk about Jesus anymore. And they were sent out. And those disciples did what disciples do, what really real disciples do when they get into trouble. They gathered and they had a prayer meeting. 
And when they had that prayer meeting, it wasn't just a now I lay me down to sleep, God is great, God is good prayer meeting. They got a hold of God and God shook the place. And when he shook the place, some incredible things were happened. You can read it. Acts 4 verse 31. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine being in a building where everybody's filled with the Holy Spirit? They spoke the word of God boldly. That meant the, the gospel went out, which is always a result. How do you know when, when people are filled? Because the word of God goes out. The believers were on one heart and one mind. Man, when I re every time I read that, I think, Lord, shake our world. In fact, I'd be okay this morning if he just came here and shook this building. Now, some of us would be awakened all of a sudden. You see, if we get shaken, we're paying attention. It's only when we're shaken that we remind, we're reminded of our mortality. It's when we're shaken that we're reminded of our frailty. When we're shaken, our pride is reduced to humility. Now, it don't mean we're perfect. People in the sixth chapter, they had all this going on and they still made the wrong decisions. They still responded wrong. Because instead of submitting to the one on the throne, instead of submitting to the one that, that was the lamb, instead of submitting, they chose that they'd rather die than submit. Today as I look at this chapter, I want us just to take a breath and be reminded of God's goodness and God's greatness. The first thing I see in the first probably six verses is a demonstration of God's greatness. Verse 1 begins after this. What in the world is he talking about? Well, you should know if you've been here at all. As Revelation has unfolded, we have seen the rapture throw the earth, the population of the earth, into turmoil because all of a sudden millions of people were caught away. Airline pilots were caught away. Planes crashed. Drivers in cars were caught, caught away. There were crashes. Policemen are caught away. And there's no law and order. And then we see chaos come as the government begin to crumble. Chaos comes, and then, and then a man steps on the scene, we know as the Antichrist, to bring peace, and we see peace. And then peace lasted a little bit, then it was war. Then it was uh, famine, which normally follows war. And then it was death. And then we see in the after this that people who trusted Christ, people who follow Christ, were being martyred. Literally, their heads taking off. We see that the residents who remain as the earth is shaken, they're wanting to die because they know there is no relief. John says, after all of this, I saw four angels. I saw four angels. And they were at the four corners of the earth. That probably takes a little bit of explanation. Four angels. First thing I want to say to you is angels... Are you listening? Angels are not former human beings who evolved into angels. Angels are a set of created beings that God created to do His bidding. They live with Him. They didn't come from us. He uses them for messengers. He uses them for fights. He uses them for all kinds of things. And now He stations four angels at the four corners of the earth. Now, four corners of the earth with Jerry. Did John think the earth was, was flat? Likely, but that has nothing to do here. He's talking about north, south, east, and west. And I will remind you that the number four from our study last fall is the number of the earth. What he's telling us is that he has placed these angels in strategic places and they are in control of the earth. Everything's still under God's control. All the melee, all the chaos, everything going on is still under God's control. And in demonstrating God's faithfulness, 
I'll just kind of lift out three, three words here. The first thing that I see is that in demonstrating his faithfulness, you see the prevention of judgment. The prevention of judgment. Now remember that the judgment has been coming now for six seals. You can go back and read chapter 6. And now the angels are at the four corners of the earth. They are in control of the situation. They hold back the winds. What are those winds? They're holding back the winds of judgment. You see, everybody was getting accustomed to one thing happening and another thing happening as the judgment of God falls. I want you to think about the situation on the earth. I want you to think about all they've experienced. And all of a sudden, it's like God calls a timeout. He calls a timeout. It's almost like he is saying, let's give them a chance to catch their breath. But you know what he's really doing? He's giving the residents on earth a chance to repent. In God's grace, greatness, he is still trying to offer some grace. Can I just step away from the story to tell you this today? It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter what storm is going on. It doesn't matter what sin is taking control. It doesn't matter what attitude is leading you. God is extending his hand of grace to you today. Because he really wants, he's really offered a way to prevent you from being judged, which we know will happen one day. He's given you a chance to repent, to turn from your sin and turn to him. You cannot face your sin and face him. It is impossible. And the same way it's not for you, you can't face him while you're chasing your sin. Demonstration of God's greatness. The first thing we see there is the prevention of judgment. The second thing we see there is the provision from judgment. John sees another angel. If you, if you still have your Bible open, we've got four angels at the four corners of the earth. Verse 3, then I saw another angel. Here's the fifth angel. He's right up. up. And he's got something in his hand. And you know what it is? It's God's mark. It's God's seal. To put it in our terms out here, it's like a branding iron. We make much of the mark of the beast that we'll get to as we go through Revelation. But listen. We need to make much of the mark of the blessed, mark of God. He's going to mark his people. It's important to have his mark in your heart. It's important in this day to have, your, have the mark on the forehead for protection because that's what the mark is provided for, protection for judgment. God is offering us protection. And he says, hang on. He says, hang on. I'm offering you this mark. And I don't want any angel to get loose. I don't want him to, to, to harm anyone. He names 144,000. These are those that he is marking. He's providing that provision for so that he can provide protection of. He wants his people protected. He loves his crown creation. He loves his people. He loves his redeemed. In his greatness, he cares about us. In God's greatness today, he's already prevented evil <laughs> from taking us out. Did you know that? If Satan had his way, he would take every one of us and lead us away from God. And you don't think he's a good leader? <laughs> he brought down a third of the angels. They followed him right out of heaven, right into the pits of hell. But here's what you need to know is that the forces of the Holy Spirit are now 
holding back the forces of evil and giving you a fighting chance. In the midst of the dark and evil culture in which we live, in the midst of the dark and evil culture that we find here in Revelation 7, God has offered protection for them and us. When you choose Christ Jesus, you will receive the down payment of his Holy Spirit in your heart. And I want to say that again, because that falls flat on Baptist. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life. Jesus says, I'll give you a, I'll, I'll give you a companion. I'll give you a comforter. Does that mean you filled it when you get with him? Well, you got him, but you may not be filled with him. Because Paul later says, be filled. Don't be drunk with wine. Be drunk with the Spirit. Be controlled by the Spirit. Some of us could have the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we've elbowed him to the, in, to the edge of our lives instead of putting him on the throne of our lives. Brothers and sisters, here's what I want to tell you about God's judgment. You can always find grace if you're looking for it in the midst of God's judgment. The greatness of God. He offers prevention. He holds it back. He offers provision. He marks us. He offers protection. So now I want you to see the display of God's goodness. Isn't it interesting that verse 1 and verse 9 begin the exact same way? After this, it says, verse 1 says, after this I saw. Verse 9 says, after this I looked. And when he looked, he saw a vast multitude of people from all over the world. Every tribe, every nation, every color, every culture. And what were these guys doing? They were answering the question that is the last part of chapter 6. And the title of last week's message when it says, Who is able to stand? And the question is answered right here. You know who's able to stand before the throne? You know who's able to stand before the Lamb? You know who's able to stand in those days? Listen. It was the martyrs. The martyrs. The people who had given their entire life, given everything that they had for him. You see, if you, if you remember chapter 6, they were given, the martyrs were given the white robes. And now the people are in front of the throne and we see their attire. They're redeemed and you see their attire. Their attire is a white robe. That white robe has now been washed. I want you to think about this. Have you ever thought about the chemical of this? Is that you take a black robe and you wash it in the red blood of Jesus and it turns white. Can you explain that? Their attire was a white robe. It's called the attire of the redeemed. The truth is, is that one of the elders came to John. He said, John, who are they, all these people? Where did they come from? Now, I think John remembered the lesson at the sixth seal. I just believe that he didn't want to appear too arrogant in this environment. And the elder reminded him, these are the guys who come out of the great tribulation. These are the guys who likely had their heads taken off. These are the guys who gave their all. Now, I have a question for us. If the people who are going to get white robes are people who have given their all, what about those who give less than their all? We give what's convenient. We give what's left over. 
We sung that song, which is right out of Scripture, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. You see, their attire was because they were pure. They were holy. They were total committed followers of Christ who had given everything for him. And now Jesus robes them in white. But not only do we see the attire, we also see the attitude. We also see the attitude. I want you to stay with me here because this is a lesson. We, we need to learn a lesson right here. Their attitude is expressed down in verse 10 when it says, They cried in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God. You know what this tells us today? Whether you get saved or whether you are not saved is an act of God. Salvation is His. Only He can save. Not the church, not traditions, not people, not preachers, not baptism, not church membership, not anything or anyone else. Only Jesus can save your soul. Steve Green many years ago wrote and sang a song, Only Jesus, only He can bring redemption full and free. There's a longing in hearts and lives that only Jesus can satisfy. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and this is why I believe David prayed in Psalm 51 after he had been found in sin, and Nathan said, you are the man. That's why he prayed, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation not of my salvation, of yours. The very reason this whole crowd can stand before the throne is because they know that their salvation belongs to, not to them, but belongs to the one who is seated on the throne, to the one who is the Lamb. The truth is, salvation is of God's. And I plead with every person in this room today, come to Jesus. I don't mean make him a part of your life. He won't accept that. He doesn't come in to be a part. He comes in to take over. He is first place or no place. You give him your all or you give him nothing. God's goodness, God's grace, greatness is waiting on you to respond to Him. It's waiting on you to give your life to Him. I plead with you, come to Jesus today and deal with God and His greatness and His goodness and experience His grace instead of waiting to deal with Him in judgment. He calls. His grace is greater than any failure you have. The last thing that I see here is what I'm going to call the affirmation. The affirmation. In God's goodness, He affirms those who have given Him His all the martyrs. First thing He does, He stands Him up in front of him. He allows them to stand before the throne and before the Lamb. He honors them. It tells us right there in verse 15, for this reason they are before the throne and they serve him day and night in the temple. They gave, his all, they gave their all. He had given his all and now he wants all creation to know. He stands him up. Second thing we see here is that he shelters them. End of verse 15, the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They'll have no more thirst, no more hunger, no more needs. The Lord is my shepherd, I, I, I shall not want. 
Whatever problems that they have, they're going to have it no more. They're now under the shelter of his wing, the shadow of his wing, the shield of his goodness. As they stand before the throne, the one who has lived, the one who has died, the one who now sits on the throne is protecting them under his shelter. Man, don't you want to be under his shelter? The last thing that I see here is that he shepherds them. You know what a shepherd does. You've, rec you've recited or read the 23rd Psalm at almost every funeral you've been to. Lord is my shepherd, shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If you look right here in verse 17, the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to the springs of of the waters of life. He's doing this at this time to protect his children from the judgment that's about to be unleashed. But folks, he wants to do that for us today. He wants to keep us from judgment today. When I think of the 23rd Psalm, I always ask, do you allow him? It says, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You let him make you do anything? He leads me beside the still waters. Do you allow him to lead you? He restores my soul. Do you allow him to restore you? It doesn't matter who you are. Jesus is a friend to broken hearted people. Whatever has broken your heart, oh, he may not be able to take it away. That's human history. But he can put salve on it and heal it. And then look at that last verse there. And he'll wipe away every tear. He can wipe away those tears. Have you ever thought about it? I'm, I'm going to explain that this way. Years ago, I was a young man. Before I knew that song lyrics could have flawed theology, I believed that if we sang it, it had to be true. Kind of like if it's on the internet, it's got to be true. And then as I got older and began to develop my biblical understanding and theology, I come to understand that a lot of songs are written by people who are well-meaning, but they are young in their faith, and they put Phrases, words, theology in a song that has no, that just doesn't stand up to the biblical test. There's an old song. Is this your favorite? You can shoot me if you like. There's an old song, was a favorite of some of my family members. It's entitled, No Tears in Heaven. You might like that song, and it may have been sung at your grandmother's funeral, and that's fine. But it will not stand up to biblical scrutiny. You know how I know? <laughs> God will wipe away all tears. Why in the world would our Lord waste time doing something that's not in there? But Jerry, then why are tears there? Well, we could have, we could have a real discussion about that. There could be all kind of honor reasons. Perhaps, perhaps at this point, they have gotten this view of earth and all the turmoil. And they see some friends down there going through the turmoil. Maybe they're crying there. Maybe, maybe they've been given the opportunity to, to see the family members who were left behind. I mean, it could be, it, it, it could be simply because they're so grateful that God loves them so much to welcome them into eternity. Maybe they've just realized what we said so stoic and say we realize. Maybe they just finally realized how great God is. How good God is. And how much He loves you. In God's greatness, He has given you a life. In His goodness, 
He offers you eternal life through Jesus. Only when you repent and surrender it all to him. About 30 minutes ago, we began this message with these words. Though man may strive to go beyond the reef of space, to crawl beyond the distant glimmering stars. This world's a room so small within my father's house, the open skies, but a portion of his yard. Can you see the magnitude of God and his greatness? Stu Hamlin, being a master lyricist, he then nails it with a chorus. He says, how big is God? That's not a question mark. It's an exclamation point. How big is God? How big and wide his vast domain? To try to tell these lips can only start. He's big enough to rule the mighty universe. And yet he's small enough to live within the heart. Brothers and sisters, Jesus wants to live in your heart. He wants to live in your heart and your life. He wants to live. He doesn't just want to be dormant. He doesn't want to be kicked to the side. He doesn't want to be in a room that you just take out one day a week to play with. In his greatness and his goodness, he wants to live in you. He wants to live through you. He wants to live with you for both time and and eternity. He could be knocking on your heart's door either to get in the first time or to get back in like he's trying to do in Revelation chapter 3. The deal about that door to your heart is there is no knob on the outside. You can't say, come in. You have to go to the door and open the door and let him in. Let's pray together.